Thank you for joining us for this episode. Today, we're joined by Dr. Jeff Wallin. We're going to be speaking about multifocals and our higher ad powers better for myopia management on the Myopia Podcast. Optometric Insights Media proudly presents the Myopia Podcast, where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of our awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Kading. Thank you again, everyone. Uh, we're here today with uh, Dr. Jeffrey Walleen. As uh, most all of you know, uh, Dr. Walleen is at uh, The Ohio State University. He's the Associate Dean uh, for Research. And uh, uh, if for, for those of you who don't know, Jeff graduated from Berkeley and, uh, and then did his master's and PhD at Ohio State. And uh, ever since the beginning, he's been super involved in research. Uh, I remember reading a lot of his research when I first came into optometry and uh, both in keratoconus and uh, by and large in, in a pediatric and now in uh, contact lens and myopia management is, uh, has been a, a good portion of his research. So Jeff, thank you very, very much for uh, joining us for this episode of the Myopia Podcast. How are Thanks you doing? Thanks for having today? me. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm stoked to talk with you because you've been uh, one of the greats in far as the research that I've listened, uh, that I've read through, and uh, really wanted to talk with you a little bit about soft multifocal lenses. I remember uh, an article that I had read about um, about soft multifocals, and for a while, the research was a little bit tough for me to dig into and apply clinically. And then your paper, uh, the first one, utilizing uh, Biofinity multifocal with a plus two add, it just kind of cemented it for me. And I said, okay, there's some things that we can do with soft multifocals and start applying them into our clinic. How, how did you kind of first get involved and interested in doing soft multifocal research? How did that enter into, uh, into your criteria, so to speak? Well, my career started um, as, a, as a PhD student with the study of alignment fit gas permeable contact lenses, mm. which then led to question of orthokeratology and whether it can slow the progression of myopia. Um, and Eventually, over time, information from Earl Smith, um, from Brian Holden came out about the possible mechanism. And looking at the possible mechanism that could slow myopia progression with orthokeratology, we thought that easily applies to soft multifocal contact lenses as well. And so that's where we started to apply that information to sort of that um, modality um, to see if it could actually slow the progression of myopia. Yeah, yeah. So walk us through the studies that you have been a part of and you have done and some of the results in those early studies that you had. And then, um, you know, I certainly want to talk with you about the, the Blinks study uh, that was published just uh, last year, 2020. And uh, so talk us through the early days and what you guys were kind of finding out. Sure. Early on, um, my PhD dissertation looked at alignment fit gas permeable contact lenses for myopia control. And we followed young kids for three years where we randomly assigned them to wear gas permeable contact lenses or soft single vision contact lenses. And ultimately what the results showed us was, was that gas permeable contact lenses appear to slow myopia progression, but when you take a look at eye growth, they really have no effect. And so most of that effect that looked like it slowed myopia progression was because we were flattening the cornea a little bit. Right. I remember so, reading that. I remember reading that paper. Yeah. And how your your data actually showed about a correct me if I'm wrong, and I know you will about a three percent increase in the progression of myopia. If I, if I remember right, it was super small, but it wasn't a reduction in the progression exactly. as everybody kind of believed. Right. And so yeah. here was some data that said no. You know, gas permeable lenses don't slow the progression. Yeah, and it was the second study to show that effect, but the first study that um, really had adequate follow-up of the patients. So mm. you know, we literally mm -hmm. didn't lose any subjects from that study. Everybody was examined after three years. And so I think the results were more meaningful and something mm. that I think we could hang our hat on at that time. Frame. And, and maybe, maybe we should also acknowledge that children can wear gas permeable lenses. Oh, absolutely. They do a fantastic <laughs> right? job. Yeah. We fit, or I, I personally fit actually, I 
146 kids and out of those 118 were able to adapt. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's about 80% that are able to adapt, which is equal to the findings that have been for adults. So they do just as good of a job. Mm -hmm. um, so what I always say is um, that gas permeable contact lenses shouldn't be fit for myopia control, but there's lots of other reasons to fit children with them, yeah. especially for the kids who can't handle soft contact lenses, yeah. for kids who have, you know, corneal astigmatism, mm -hmm. for, you know, I think there are lots of reasons. Yeah. Yeah. And then you did some orthokeratology work. Um, yeah. So with orthokeratology, we um, uh, just actually the study started off um, where we just fit kids with orthokeratology contact lenses and um, we compared them to a historical control group. It happened to be mm -hmm. the control group from another study. And we matched the, the, the kids based on age and refractive error, I believe it was. And we found that we could slow the growth of the eye with orthokeratology contact lenses. But before that, we had to show that kids could wear them. And so we actually did a study before that. This is very early in the process um, before they were even FDA approved, um, where we took a look at kids and their, and their ability to, to independently care for the contact lenses as well as get a nice treatment benefit. Yeah. And showed that, you know, after a couple of weeks, they could go all day long without glasses or contact lenses and still see clearly. Mm -hmm. And correct me if I'm wrong, the protocol of that, uh, of that ortho case study that you did was very similar to Pauline's study because that had just come out uh, in 2003, 2004, and she compared it to spectacles and you compared yours to soft uh, spherical lenses. If I remember the, the control group, which wasn't studied, but it was retrospectively evaluated. Is that correct? That's exactly right. So still, we lacked a randomized clinical trial until Pauline Cho and her colleague and her colleagues did that several years later. Right, right. But I, I, I loved that because Pauline's initial data that she came out with was like this big punch in the gut, like, oh, wow, you know, now we have some data, we had presumed all this information. And I think it was one of the, the first studies that really showed nearly 50%. And then your data came out shortly after that, showing similar results with a, a larger group. And, uh, and then now you're entering into the soft multifocal arena. I, I know I'm jumping over a lot of your work. So <laughs> but now you're jumping into the soft multifocals. Uh, what brought you in there? Yeah, it really it was that idea of what, why do we think orthokeratology works? I think we can apply it to soft multifocals. So our original study for soft multifocal contact lenses was actually randomly assigning kids to a plus two ad or a plus four ad. So, mm -hmm. and then we were going to use a historical control group for both of those. But the first two kids that came back for their follow up visit with the plus four ad, I couldn't correct them to better than 20, 25. And it just didn't seem ethical to me to randomly assign some kids to something that didn't provide them with adequate vision. Um, so we stopped that randomized clinical trial and enrolled all the kids in the plus two ad, and then we compared them to that same historical control group. Um, and again, found that it did slow myopia progression and eye growth actually in that study. So um, it was an important finding at the time. Yeah. Now you've, you've done several analysis uh, on different forms of myopia management over the years and so forth. But I, I want you to talk a little bit about the Blink study that was published. And in this group, you did both high and, and a lower ad, if I remember correctly. So talk us through how you got into that and, you know, tell us a little bit about your results. I'll tell you how I got into it was I actually applied to the National Institutes of Health for a grant yeah. on orthokeratology and a lot of people didn't like the idea of fitting kids with orthokeratology so we switched to soft multifocal so that's oh. how ultimately how we got there. Um, Interesting. But, so speak on that like wh yeah. what do you think what do you think is the, was the reason for that? <laughs> It's the reason that that still exists today, and it's that ophthalmology does not like fitting kids with orthokeratology, really contact lenses in general, but primary orthokeratology, and they were the primary reviewers. Mm. Um, and there was no way we could get around that, so we knew we had to do something different. Mm. Um, so then we use soft multifocal contact lenses, and the feedback we got there was, why don't you use, we were just going to use the 250 ad, why don't you use the 150 ad? 
So basically it added an, another group to our study, but we didn't get any more funds, <laughs> but <laughs> we did the work and got the answer. And I think it's a really important answer. And it shows that, you know, the stronger the ad power, um, the better it works for myopia control. And it may be that there is a, basically all it showed was that 250 ad works, 150 ad didn't work. Um, so there may be a maximum level, you know, maybe plus two, something like that, that beyond which you are lower than that, you don't get any effect and above that you get an effect, you know, there may be one mm -hmm. single level. Um, what we don't know is if a three ad would work better than a 250 or a 350 would work better than right. a 250. So, right. uh, you know, there's lots more questions that could be answered, but at least we answered that one. Mm -hmm. Are you able to go back and extrapolate any of the information on the 150 versus two versus 250 because you did do a plus two study and now you've had 250 study. Are you looking at that data? Have you, have you looked or thought about that at all? Um, not really. And simply because a lot of the axial length data were, I think with a scan ultrasound with the, the plus sure. two ad, it's also a different slightly different contact lens design. It was ProClear multifocal with the plus two ad versus Biofinity, which they're, they're slightly different, but not all that different. Um, right. uh, but it's not, it's not a bad question to be perfectly honest. I, I had now <laughs> actually thought of it. So I, I learn all the time. I love this. <laughs> I, well, I'm, I'm, I'm also curious if you have a presumption and uh, as scientists, I know you love to do that. Do you think that a plus three, four would have made much of a difference? And obviously we lose something in a plus four group mm -hmm. uh, yeah. as you discovered in your original study. But um, I've kind of wondered that, right? And, and you know, one of my mentors says, hey, use the highest ad possible. Well, we now know that that is true based upon your blink study and that was presumed before. But, uh, you know, should I potentially sacrifice the patient's vision for uh, a high fast progressing we don't know that data necessarily yeah. but yeah. um you know what would you say to a clinician with that question i would say probably not and the reason i say that is Catherine bickle actually just published her um uh, master's thesis in optometry and vision science mm -hmm. where she randomly assigned kids to wear single vision for one week plus two ad for one week plus three ad and plus four ad each of those for a week when they came back after one week we had them answer questions subjectively about their vision and we measured their vision objectively mm -hmm. and what we found was that plus three ad and plus four ad resulted in worse vision both subjectively and objectively it wasn't consistently worse, but it was worse in certain areas. And so based on that and the fact that, you know, the higher ad range makes it more difficult to order, longer to come in, more expensive, I don't think it's really all that worth it. But I think that a higher ad power would maybe work better. Um, mm -hmm. We've also done work with just normal ad power and taken a look at the effects of different optic zone sizes and also add powers on subjective quality of vision, really in optometry students. Um, and so we found sort of what we think it might be the, the best, the optimal point or how, what's the strongest, the, you know, the smallest optic zone and the strongest add power that we can ultimately use and not affect vision too much. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we need to publish those data, but um, you know, that's what we're looking at is trying to optimize it so we can maximize that that um, ad power as much as possible. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the excitement around your data brings to the clinic, cl the clinician, some evidence and, uh, you know, something that's maybe a little easier or perceived to be easier for myopia management being a soft multifocal. And we're somewhat familiar with that, right? You published data on the achieve study showing that kids could wear contact lenses and, you know, the obstacles that we need to overcome if we're going to fit contact lenses on children with, you know, insertion and removal time made being really the biggest difference. I um, mean, it's not even that substantial, but your, your data really helps us as clinicians feel that, you know, really anybody can do myopia management, whether you do atropine soft multifocals. And now we have an FDA approved product that is out there. There's other products that are being used that are not FDA approved. What, what do you kind of see as this next evolution in the soft multifocal world 
uh, with increased products, with increased utilization. Uh, and here's the big question is, how do we get more people fitting soft multifocals for uh, myopia management? Yeah, um, so I appreciate what you said earlier and because my goal is always to produce research results that practitioners can put into practice literally the next day. Um, so that's what I hope. And, and I hope that if they listen to science and they um, see that it is achievable in their practice the next day, that they do put it into practice. So that's the goal of the research that we conduct. Um, and, you know, we ought to be providing evidence-based practice. And so, you know, I think you, you can't deny the evidence. Um, mm -hmm. So I really think that that's probably where we're headed. Sure. I also think that now that we have an FDA approved product and, and companies will be able to go directly to the consumer, consumers will be demanding it. So we better, you better catch up is sort of my advice to practitioners mm -hmm. who aren't doing myopia control at this time. Um, and then I forgot the second part of your question. <laughs> how do we how do we get more people, uh, you know, on board yeah. with it? What's uh, you know, what do you feel? Oh, you, you answered that. Actually, you said you better catch up. Uh, but then if you want to expand on that, you can. But then is what's the future look like? Oh, what right. do you think? Uh, where are we going? Yeah. So what we think is that the more myopic defocus, in other words, the further in front of the retina that we provide the focus of light through the peripheral part of the contact lens, the better it controls myopia. But we don't know specifically what about that myopic defocus the eye is trying to follow. So is it trying to follow the most myopic meridian because we know peripherally there's an increase in astigmatism. We don't know if it's trying to follow the least you know, spherical aberration, for example, or the least higher order aberrations, we don't honestly know. So I think that's where we're headed in looking at the individual characteristics. And we've measured a lot of these things with the BLINK study. So I can tell you personally that, you know, that's where our next papers will be looking at is what are the signals that the eye is looking for to just try and slow growth. And then once we know that, we can optimize contact lens design to try and optimize myopia control through you know, manipulation of those optical signals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I also think we're trying to make the signal as strong as we can by providing different designs. And so, you know, I think some of the designs that you see out there are already trying to do that. We just need to know if they work. Right, right. Yeah, because there is some variability as far as uh, some of the studies with different uh, designs and so forth. And, you know, certainly, uh, but but not all the studies are done the same. So you kind of have to extrapolate some and of that. And not in the same sample. Sure. And yeah. Yep, 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 yep. Well, yeah, certainly appreciate your work in this area. You know, myopia management beings, uh, what it is, uh, you know, 15 years ago, I, you know, was thinking about myopia management and in, 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 I've lectured all around the world on myopia management and it seems like we're hitting the tipping point. Do you feel that way as well? Oh, 100%. I think it's because of the increasing prevalence of myopia worldwide, as well as the very fast evolution of scientific information that we have available to us. And honestly, because I think practitioners have figured out that it can be, you know, a way to attract patients to the practice because it can make you unique in your area. And that's really the only way you can attract more patients. You got to be unique. If you're the same mm -hmm. as every other practice as the one down the street, what, what would be the guide to bring people into your practice. So I think yeah. all of that combined is sort of led to a tipping point. Yeah. So uh, now, you know, I'm going to ask you a clinical question and you've readily admitted, you know, that you, you aren't, you don't have a practice of your own, but um, what, what kind of recommendations would you give somebody who says, I, I don't know, I don't know about any of this stuff. I've, mm -hmm. I've never done this. I've been in practice for 10 or 15 or 20 years. Now there's these, this data that's coming available. How do I get started and what do I tell parents? Yeah, um, so what you can tell parents is what we can achieve on average. And mm. basically what we can do is we can slow myopia progression by about 40% with soft multifocal contact lenses. So I think that's things that parents can sort of understand. But I think the ultimate goal is basically just to make the child less myopic than the parents. 
you know, that they mm-hmm. can definitely understand. So you um, want you better, you want your kid better than you. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it. So, you know, and that, that puts it in definite terms that, you know, almost every parent can understand because as we know, most myopic children have myopic parents. So, mm-hmm. and, and the ones that do are the ones that are most likely to be brought in for myopia control. So I think yeah. that's, you know, that's our basic message. Um, the more difficult message is that, you know, if we can keep your child from becoming as nearsighted as he or she would have naturally, then we can decrease the risk of sight threatening complications that they might experience after age 60. So this isn't for a long, long time, but you want to do what you can to save your child's vision over a lifetime. And yeah. now's the time to do it. Um, so, yeah. you know, I, I, I hope between those messages, parents will get it. Yeah. I think that's a, that's a tough one for clinicians because we know that we're not going to be the one who sees those complications in the child, but yet we're seeing the patients who are in their sixties, seventies and eighties who were children you know, 40, 50, 60 years ago and had something happen. And so, you know, my, my big plea is to, you know, realize that the 80 year old that you just saw is the exact same patient as the 10 year old you just saw. And had you been able to do something, could you have, uh, could you have saved that patient from whatever it was? And, you know, I oftentimes ask clinicians when we're, when I'm lecturing is, Think about the high myopes that you have pre-cataract surgery who, uh, who, who don't have pathology and, you know, how many of them that, that were, you know, six, seven, eight, nine myopes don't have any retinal pathology. And, you know, Jeff, when we start thinking about that, it's, there's not very many, I can't think of any in my practice. Right. Yeah. And so certainly we need to bring that awareness. So, well, hey, I sure appreciate you joining us for the Myopia podcast. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to have you on again. And thanks for all your work. We sure appreciate it. Thank you. This podcast was brought to you by Optometric Insights Media. If you enjoy our content, please leave a five star review and don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes.